Hi there, friends. Welcome to another edition of the TechSoup Connect Western Canada chapter. My name's Eli, and I'll be one of your co-hosts today. Here, co-hosting with me and managing the chat will be my colleague, Ben Abel, who is also on the organizing team. Today, we're bringing you together for one of my most favorite event formats, which is the hot new trends you should be worried slash excited about for the coming year. My name is Eli. I'll be one of your hosts. But what I'm really going to do is just keep on throwing you to our expert presenters. I want to first start off with one of my heroes, one of the nonprofit techies who have been building community for a long time. That's Jai Dua from Agentic Media, Digital Media. And so let's send it over to Jai, who can talk a little bit about AI to start today's event. Thanks, Eli. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about AI and art, unlocking the potential of artificial intelligence for nonprofits. All the images, of course, were generated by an AI art process. And I use Staple Diffusion, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So what can AI art do for you? I think that as a, if you're a scrappy nonprofit, there's a lot of things. So creating pictures for posters, imagining scenarios, drawing very specific images for your website and also providing images or pictures of people. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So when is that like pictures for posters? And these are generated by giving a text prompt. So you would say, draw me a picture of people engaged in everyday digital activities, and you might get something like this back. Another one I was really interested in doing and I was sharing on my Twitter was imagining scenarios. So here's one of Vancouver flooding. We know that sometimes trying to create some emotional aspect can really impact people's desire for action. So Vancouver flooding was one of the ones I was looking at. I also did a ones on Vancouver fire, which was also disturbing. Images for your website. You can see on the left there, an AI generated image of a wolf. On the right, some large cedar trees, some old growth forests. Again, these were very straightforward prompts, just saying, show me a solo wolf in a forest. Uh, the other one was draw me a dreamy picture of a cedar tree with a small person. One of the other things you can do is use faces of people. So there's a site called thispersondoesnotexist.com, and I'm going to drop a couple of links into the chat in a moment, but you can see the quality of this is really increased. And one of the interesting things is you can see one of my clients using a picture on the left there and using them for examples that can help clarify or to give a little sense of what the kind of human aspect of, ironically, the human aspect of a particular legal issue on their website. So how do you do all of this? Okay, so as I mentioned, these text prompts. So here was a prompt, and I've been giving you the very simple prompt, but there are a little bit more complicated ones. So here you can see solo snow leopard in the snowy mountains, photo, highly detailed, smooth, et cetera, et cetera. But the result was actually quite lovely. And you can, in most of these, you can get a number of different ones at the same time. So you can request a batch. And I'm just going to drop into the chat a couple of these links so that you can see. One of the interesting pieces that you can see is that there are a number of different ones that will do a little bit more powerful. And I've given you a very simple one to understand. Yeah, let's just talk about quickly the caveats. So the images generated have no copyright. You can't really own them in the sense of that they weren't really created by a human. But there are some court cases of people trying to understand what the issues are around that. Also, a lot, some of the AIs are trained on a kind of large scrape of images off the web. So that can also exacerbate our biases as well as grabbing images from porn or violent imagery. And as somebody's been pointing out, some artists are angry that AIs are trained on the work of living artists. And that's been a little bit more around the issue of some of the court cases. And then some artists are concerned that artificial intelligence, these AI art generators will take their jobs away. It's really, I think, a tool and it's up to you to decide whether this fits within your uh, toolkit or not. But hopefully you can try at least to experiment and see what results you have. And that's really it. So thank you. I'm Sarah from Charity Shift, and I work with small nonprofits to help them fundraise more. 
So I'm going to be talking about Loom. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Loom, it is a video messaging tool that helps you instantly share videos. What's really great about it, I think not only is it free or updated subscription is about $10 a month, but it also delivers directly to an email inbox. So no need to download or sign up for anything for the recipient. And it also will record your camera, your microphone, and your desktop all at one time. So from a fundraising perspective, one of the ways that I've seen this work really well is to do report backs to donors. So imagine that you are running a food bank and something exciting happens within the organization. And in that moment, you can record a video on your phone and share it directly with your supporters. It's also a really great way to thank your donors. Being that it's mid-January, for those of you that are in small organizations, you're probably quite busy doing your handwritten thank you notes and all the follow-up that's required after our big holiday fundraising campaigns. Loom videos are fantastic. It takes about a minute to five minutes maybe at the most to just quickly record a video and directly thank your donors. Another way that I've seen it work really well, especially for those of you who are responsible for tech within your organizations, with IT support, because you can record, as I mentioned, your microphone, your camera, and your desktop all at the same time. It's a really great tool to use when you are trying to share instructions. So how many times have we had somebody say, oh, I got locked out of my system or I forgot my password or how do I update in our donor database? You can record that answer. You can record yourself actually completing that task while you are talking about the, the instructions that you're providing. It's a really great way to give examples. It's also nice for those of us who have new employees joining us, we can welcome them by video. It's so much more personal than just an email. And it also helps people feel a bit more connected to their teams when they are working in different time zones, different locations, and that sort of thing. As I mentioned, talking about instructions for repeated or for complex tasks, that's something that I really like. It also saves time in terms of not having to have meetings or set up a time to meet, to walk somebody through something. You can just record yourself doing that on the screen. So in terms of Loom, as I mentioned, it is free and you can have up to 25 videos. Once you hit beyond 25 videos, it is about $10 Canadian a month, like $8 US. But I would say in terms of the time savings and the cost savings for those communication pieces that you're able to use quite a bit faster. And for various purposes, I feel like it's a really good investment for small organizations. As well, I found so much feedback from donors who open up their email and they have a video that's directly for them that really makes your organization stand out. Great question. How does it differ from Canva video creation? It's similar, Ryan. I haven't used the Canva video creation, so I'm not too sure how it looks on the recipient side. I know with Loom, it will directly play within within the actual email. So that is one bonus. You don't need to leave the actual email to, to view the Loom video, but I'm not too sure about Canva video creation. I know Canva's got some fantastic different content creation pieces. And I just wanted to mention in terms of why video, I think is a big trend, about 80% of content is retained from video. And it's also obviously for people who learn differently are able to both visualize, see what's happening, receive the message, and also of course, pause, rewind, rewatch content as much as they need. I will put a link to Loom as well as to my LinkedIn if anybody has follow-up questions, or if you do use Loom, I'd love to hear how you are using it in your organization. Thanks so much. Up next, we've got Amelia with DataViz for Nonprofits, who's going to give you some tips on how you can up your DataViz game in 2023. I'm Amelia Kahn. Great to be with you today. So what are you doing wrong on social media? In short, you're not deploying data visualization in your posts. When I produce nonprofit posts, I mostly see bad photos. I don't know if they're generated by AI or not, but they're bad. The headshots, stock images, only some of which cl clearly relate to the text or no image at all. So Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn are like crowded highways packed with billboards. If we add charts, maps, and graphs to our billboards, we can both grab attention and say something meaningful. But the image and message should be simple and clear to travelers zooming by. 
So what types of data visualizations, again, charts, graphs, and maps work best in social media? I'm here to give you four to consider. Number one is maps. If the map shows a geography we already know, like I'm in the U.S., so I'm showing you the U.S., or your own city, we have a lot of prior knowledge that we can apply. This makes maps easy to digest on the fly. We look for our own location. We compare east to west, cities to rural areas. Consider showing the distribution of the need you are addressing, the location of your clientele, or where you're providing services using the ends or bands also make good social media content. So B-A-N stands for big S number. Just one large number can capture attention. The BANs shown here are from Women Will, which is a Google initiative focused on economic empowerment for women. They won a Shorty Award, which honors the best content creators on social media. Think about what single number you might want to share that could spark interest in your work and consider adding a link from your BAN post to a chart that provides more context and detail for that number. Here's another idea, line graphs. So line graphs are familiar. Many show change over time. So if we make it clear what is changing, here it's the number of deaths. And over what period of time, we can tell a quick and powerful story without much more than an angled line. But keep it simple with only one line, or you could show multiple lines, but highlight only one in color and gray out the West. Consider, for example, showing how the need for your services or your impact has changed over time. And finally, bar charts are usually a good option for social media posts. Bar charts are trusted friends. We get them. When deploying bar charts, use color strategically to encourage a comparison of a target group to comparison groups. This post from the World Wildlife Fund is a follow-up to an earlier post which asks followers a question. This post gives them the answer in a simple bar chart and shows them what percent of followers guessed each answer. You can see that on the right. So I hope I've given you a few ideas for your next post. If you want more ideas for better using and showing your data, please sign up for my blog, 60 Second Data Tips, or my website, nonprofitviz.com. Each week, you'll get a brief tip to help you up your data game. And I'd be happy to talk with you about your data and how best to visualize it in dashboards, presentations, reports, and websites. Feel free to schedule a free consultation on my website, which again is nonprofitviz.com. And I've enjoyed our very brief time together. Thank you. We've got Rowena coming in from the New School of Fundraising who's going to be talking about maximizing impact with limited resources, the new reality of demonstrating value. So hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And yes, I am the founder and lead instructor of the New School of Fundraising, which is a virtual fundraising school, which helps anyone in Canada to raise money. I was the marketing person's worst nightmare when she said, what is your audience? And I said, anybody who wants to raise money, that's who we help. So thank you for help, for letting me be here. This is really exciting for me. So the new reality of fundraising, where do we say post pandemic now? We are, I don't want to jinx us, but heading into potentially recessions, some tough times. And what we hear across the board is we have to do more with less. There's more need than ever before. Where do we go from that? My school is about let's turn everything on its head. Let's rethink it. Let's not just go back to what we were doing before. Let's think about this. And a big one is how we demonstrate impact. So I'd love to hear what does impact, oh, I'm gonna, what does impact mean to you? Jump into the chat. One word. When I say impact, what does that mean to you? What is impactful to you? Positive change, meaningful change, improving people's lives, outcomes. Oh, you guys, really good. It has an effect. Change in behavior. Oh, and Eli didn't press my five minute timer at before I went. I was too excited to get started. All good. I'm on it. People participate. Thanks, you guys. Great. I think it's a really interesting thing. We think of donors and we often think of them as other people, but we are donors too. And we experience impact. And when we read something, we feel impact from it, or we have great examples of something that has shown us impact. 
and therefore value. Some people find value in the big bag of swag that comes in a direct mail piece. I personally don't. I do take the little things and use them sometimes, but I usually tell that organization to stop emailing me or mailing me. But if that didn't work, it wouldn't happen. So we have to think about how can we demonstrate impact at organizations? And that often is about storytelling. So if we look at stories, what do we use these stories for? Let's look acquisition, cultivation, solicitation, stewardship, et cetera. All of our lovely words that we use across the donor cycle. In every, every aspect of that, we use storytelling. What sometimes happens, though, is we think of these things all separately. We don't think of them as one, one story that could go across the board. Then where do we use stories? Well, we use those in our collateral, in our grant applications, in person. I want you to think, how knowledgeable are your board members, or your volunteers, or your ambassadors to be able to share your stories in person? How much are they armed with your stories? What do they have in their toolkit? I can probably guarantee you that it's less than you think that they have. So always something to think about. Our social media, our direct mail, our website, all of these ways. A really fun activity to do with your team is to sit at your next team meeting and talk about if I was to ask you, why your organization? Why would I give to your organization? And what makes your organization unique? This starts to form your story, which is also important. And what's really neat, involve everyone in this conversation because the answers to this are really interesting to, to look through. And you usually get the biggest surprise or unexpected answer from somebody who's not involved with fundraising. It doesn't have anything to do with fundraising at this point. And then to back up what Amelia said, when we are sharing, oh, sorry, there's a spelling mistake. When we are sharing stories, we have to consider videos and photos as well. And that pages, look at this statistic, pages with visuals drive 94% more views on average. Our visuals are processed faster than words. And this is where I'm going to double down. I think often we think, the whole topic of the talk was about how do we do less with, how do we do more with less? And we have to think about who is collecting these stories for us. Are we involving volunteers? How about past participants from our organization? Are we asking youth to collect the stories? What a great opportunity for youth. Are they our clients that are collecting the stories, if that's appropriate, or our board members? I know at nonprofits, we tend to keep this in-house and it's a bit of a protection thing. I don't know, we have some trust issues. We need to all go through a bit of a trust system together. But I want to tell you, look at these happy people. This is why they're happy. How can you use stories and how can you show impact and also address other things that you need to happen? So say you were an organization that was working on youth leadership, youth and girls and women's leadership, and you needed to recognize a sponsor. Let's not put up on social media the check presentation anymore. Let's not put out the thank you to ABC company for sponsoring this. Nobody likes us. Nobody cares about those and they don't get good traffic. What if we ask that organization to, to supply a female leader at the organization and we had one of our youth go and volunteer and interview her? What if we did this? What if we had that youth and provided this beautiful mentorship opportunity and growth opportunity for our youth? We had this great interview, which drove our own objectives as well. And who knows what could happen? I can almost guarantee that relationship would keep going between the two of them, which would be great. And we actually had people read it. So in all of our, in a lot of our sessions, we say to people, let's think about what we need and let's think about how we're showing impact and let's think about what's not needed anymore. And we have organizations say, but we have to do that. The sponsors need that. The companies require that. Do they? Or do we just keep putting it on agreements? Because I guarantee you that. Time. Okay, that's it. That was it. Next, we've got nonprofit expert Jason Shim, who's going to be talking about AI from a different direction around using AI text generation for nonprofits. So I'm going to be talking today about AI text generation, and I'm going to jump straight into it. You may have heard of a transformer model, and you'll be hearing more about them in 2023. And what it was is a, it's a model that was developed by the Google Brain team in their AI department, and it was open sourced in 2017. And what came out of that were a couple of subsequent models, namely BERT and GPT, which I'm going to be spending the bulk of this presentation talking about. 
Now, GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And what does pre-trained mean? It means that it was trained on huge bodies of text on the internet, including Wikipedia, as well as something called the Common Crawl, which is petabytes of data crawled from across the internet. And this is hosted by an organization called OpenAI. Now, OpenAI, one of their significant investors is Microsoft, and Microsoft owns it. And GitHub Copilot was something that came out in 2021. And what it is, essentially, you can input comments about what you would like a snippet of code to do, and it will auto-complete the rest. Now, it may not always be you know, accurate or correct, but it's, it's Copilot, so it's alongside a developer that is coding this up, and it can significantly accelerate the software development process. Now, why am I sharing all this and why is this relevant for nonprofits? A similar technology now exists for general text uh, completion. And so ChatGPT is the latest release in a series of GPT models. There has been GPT 2, 3, and ChatGPT is considered 3.5. And here's a quick example of how ChatGPT could be used with a, a prompt. As a creative experiment, write me a poem about technology in the nonprofit sector. And it generated this in a few seconds. Technology, a force so grand in the hands of a nonprofit, a helping hand. It's not the best poem in the world, but it did generate this in a few seconds. I'll take it for the time being. Requires some editing. But in terms of a practical application, something to keep in mind is it could be potentially used for generating drafts. So let's say if you're writing a grant and here's a pretty standard question that you'll find in a grant, describe your project in detail, including proposed timeline and specifically how you use the funds. And here is the response. The actual response is about five paragraphs long. By no means would I say that you should copy and paste this directly into a grant application, but this could be used to help scaffold a potential response and to help think through how might you integrate some content that is particular to your organization to supplement what is here. Another example would be around like things like marketing drafts. So here's a prompt where to draft a blog post, but how GPT can be used to help nonprofits. And this, the blog post that was generated was about five paragraphs long. You can make it longer or shorter. And again, like the blog post itself, it's okay, it's generic, but it's more around generating that first draft for potential use. So this is something to keep in mind as you know, something that has potential in this area. Now, one thing to keep in mind too, is that it can be confident, but not necessarily correct. And you definitely need a human in the loop there. So here's an example of that confidence that's not necessarily correct. The question, how many nonprofits are there in Canada? is that it's saying that there's 170 registered charity, 170,000 registered charities in Canada. Now that number is charities and nonprofits number, but it's stating it here quite confidently and the actual number is closer to 86,000. It does require fact checking and that this really is just pulling from the scouring the internet, but it's not necessarily correct all the time. So what do nonprofits need to keep in mind? As a potential use case, first drafts, it could be used. Let's say you need to put together something, whether it be a draft of a document or potentially you need to draft an email. You can integrate certain elements where it's like, hey, can you help draft an email that is going out to a donor? Also indicate that you just saw them recently at a gala, ask them about the following things as well, and it can draft up something in a few seconds. Again, you wouldn't send it out sight unseen. You would still need to review it. And on that point, Human review is important. Whenever working with AI at this point, making sure that you have people to ensure that all the facts are correct in it and that it's still reflecting your organizational tone and that it's more of a supplement in that regard. And keeping in mind the quality inputs are needed for effective outputs. In addition to the pre-trained models, it, it's expected that you should in the future be able to input additional text. So let's say if you have a case for support, which might make a great piece of text for a model to, to look at, as well as things like brand books for your organization so that indicate how do we talk about organization? What is the tone that you use? These kinds of things would be helpful for informing future prompts that you would use for AI text generation. It's not going away anytime soon. This was a tweet last night from Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft and that uh, ChatGPT is coming to the Azure OpenAI service. So it will be integrated into some of the broader offerings that Microsoft is offering in the future. And moving into the future, there are other models on the horizon, GPT-4, which is going to be the next iteration of the GPT models, as well as Lambda, which is Google's offering and others are on the horizon. My suggestion to everyone here is uh, try it out. I'll drop a link in the, in the chat for ChatGPT as well, if you haven't tried it already. And one thing to keep in mind is that we, this is a very quickly evolving space and that the it would be helpful for folks to, to find their own use cases for it. Once again, if you want to ensure that the future with AI is going to be useful for your organization, jump right in there and also experiment with it a little bit and figure out what the use case may be for your particular organization or use case. If you'd like to stay in touch, I'll also drop more information in the chat to connect on LinkedIn.
So next, I want to bring in another deep thinker in the nonprofit tech space, which is Renee Black of GoodBot, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the work she's been doing around responsible tech, which, as we start talking about AI and its uncertainness, is one of the many ways we can start talking about that responsible tech. So with that, over to you, Renee. So yeah, my name is Renee Black. Thanks for having me here today. I'm not going to be talking as some of the other presenters so much about the use of technology, more about the, some of the impacts of technology on society. And, and, and a good bot's a new project that's just getting started off the ground. It's, it falls on to some work that I did several years ago with an organization that I founded called Peace Geeks. My old team at Peace Geeks worked, among other things, on projects with digital peace builders in the Middle East, working to respond to extremism and polarization. And in 2018, when Facebook changed its algorithm to optimize for engagement so they could sell more ads, the impacts on the communities that we were serving were really significant and didn't take long to manifest in really challenging situations in communities and in some cases manifesting in violence outside of digital spaces. So peace building is my work and my passion for the last 10 years. But after I stepped away from Peace Geeks, I started to think about what I wanted to do next and started to think about some of these fundamental systemic issues and the roles that they're playing in, in posing challenges to communities around the world. But also here at home, where they tend to manifest a little bit later on, it, it's something that I really wanted to get into. I, I think as I started to take a step back and think about what the harms look like and try to understand it at a bigger scale, it's pretty overwhelming. There's a lot of issues around the misalignment of venture capitalist funding models. There's issues around a lack of transparency, deep fakes, disinformation, misinformation. There's automation of jobs. There's cyber stalking. There, and there's a lot of interconnected issues that are starting to come into, into more salience now. But if you're starting to try to think about where to jump in, it's pretty overwhelming. And there's a lot of different, the good news is there's a lot of different people thinking about this. But we are at this moment in time where we've got the situation where humanity has the Paleolithic motions, medieval institutions, and godlike god -like technology. And we are in this moment in time where there's a bit of a crisis that we're needing to try to address. And at this moment, there's a number of different nonprofit organizations that are starting to, to try to fill the void of this responsible tech space. There's people like All Tech is Human, which are really trying to create some salience around different people who are working to try to improve technology within companies and also try to think about what the social impacts are of technology. There's conveners like Access Now, which holds one of the biggest digital right conferences in the world. There's folks like the Tech Stewardship Program that are here in Canada, which do a, a micro-credential around trying to improve understanding around some of the values tensions as you are developing technology. And so there's a budding and growing community of responsible tech practitioners that are coming online, but don't necessarily know one another. And so one of the one of the roles I'm hoping to be able to play a good bod is to try to do some convening around this work. The other thing is that as we've been as this as the, some of these harms have become more evident, we've seen changes in where problems are being addressed. Initially, there was a lot of work at the at the incident sort of events level trying to understand what was happening. But increasingly, we're starting to see organizations that are getting deeper and looking at the underlying structures. Again, like things like the VC funding models that are creating some of the financial incentives for companies to take actions that they actually understand are going to be, that have potential to be harm and that disincentivize them away from taking a do no harm approach. The work right now in what the folks in power prediction call the in-between times. So where we are still working very much within the institutional structures that we have traditionally used, and they're not going to serve us for the way that technology is evolving. As we've been hearing from some of our presenters, it's moving at such a fast pace and with implications that are very significant, including that you're now going to be able to generate websites, generate music, generate photos, generate videos. And so the ability, we are already not able to deal with misinformation and disinformation and deep fakes. This is only going to become a bigger problem. And the role impact on social trust in communities is only going to deepen if we don't come up with the right mechanisms for responding to this. So we're at this moment in time where some small networks are starting to form around how to do this, but we don't yet have the institutions that we need and we don't yet have the collaboration we need to get there. But those two things are going to be critical going forward. So this is just an example of some of the different AI. GPT Chat GPT has been one of the ones that's been getting a lot of attention, but there's a lot of other tools that are out there right now. We've been hearing about some others today. And, and so this is going to manifest in a lot of ways across our society. And, and hopefully we're building towards a future that is prioritizing 
things like trust and strong governance and strong digital rights and transparency and accountability. But it requires intent and actual change and changing the incentive structures and not just doing the tech equivalent of greenwashing. We want to make sure that we want to commit to building strong trust-based communities and digital spaces. And that's all for me today. Thank you. Now we're going to come back to Kirk on engaging with video gamers. All right. So as I mentioned, the first go, I did a four week intensive on gaming fundraising and try to go through that a little bit. So if you're doing event fundraising, you're probably doing things like golf tournaments, peer to peer events, pledge drives and telephones. When you're talking about video game fundraising and streaming fundraising, it's all of these put together all in one. So if you think of it like a golf tournament, you've got gamers participating, you've got people who are doing things for charity. Like a peer-to-peer -peer event, it is going to be their followers, their, the people who subscribe to them, the people who are interested in them, who will be the ones who quite often will be the donors. And then like a telethon, it is done live. And there's often goals that are based on the time, like what time they are within the program. The image here is from one of the most famous video game fundraising pieces, the Desert Bus for Hope. This has been going on for over a decade, but they will be required to do certain things at certain times or try to raise a certain amount of money at certain times. There will be special incentives for you to donate certain amounts so that the gamer might do something funny, might draw a piece of art, might do something silly on, on camera if they get a certain donation of a certain type. And the way I liken this is imagine you had a golf tournament with cameras following every golfer around. And it was like, if you give a thousand dollars to the, on behalf of this golfer, he now has to hit the next ball. Like he's happy Gilmore. That's the type of thing that is happening in video game fundraising. And so it's a very live, very interactive style of fundraising. Now, is it worth it for you? So Dr. Lupo, a famous streamer, as of 2022, has raised over $13 million for St. Jude. In 2020, over $83 million was raised on Twitch. That is the broadcasting platform that tends to be used by gamers. There's also, of course, YouTube. There's a lot of gamers that stream on TikTok, but Twitch tends to be the main one, and that's how much was raised in 2020. It has only increased since then, and there's probably not a lot of end to that increase right now. And the nice thing is you can run an event. You can, you can run it yourself and have a bunch of streamers join you. Or you could just with different content creators and help. Now, I like to pick on golf tournaments. The fact of the matter is a lot of charities do them. If you look at the stats, there are 25 million golfers in the United States who golfed in 2021. There, it's an expected 66 million people worldwide. And of course, it requires this massive green space that requires all sorts of water and all sorts of issues around environment versus almost 10 times that play video games in the United States. 215 million gamers in the United States, three and a quarter billion worldwide. And really, it requires the Internet. So there's a lot of capacity, a lot of potential. This is from one of my favorite video games, Rocket League. This is the Rocket League Championship Series. This is actually a stadium full of people watching people play video games. Uh, so if you've never been part of this community, it is very much a, yes, people actually do enjoy pe watching other people play video games. My parents didn't believe that when I told them that when I was a kid. They've had to make a couple of that now because this is the type of thing that happens. So there's large audiences, a lot of people involved. It's definitely a culture in a world. New expectations management's about this. If you start getting into this, you're not going to make that $13 million overnight. It's going to be like many other peer-to-peer -peer events that you run. The nice thing is it's relatively low cost to get involved in this type of thing. And there's a lot of potential reach. If you reach out to your donors, a lot of them are going to be video gamers. About 70% of people in the United States are video gamers of some sort. You are not held to an annual cycle. So you can do a tournament next week. You can do a tournament this week, whatever you want. You engage with different content creators. You're not held to the annual cycle like you are with a lot of events. It really is about relationships, much like major gift fundraising, much like plan giving fundraising. It's about relationships with those content creators. They're not ATMs, but they are always interested in helping. And it's not just video games. So I talk about video games because it's the main one. But people do a lot of tabletop gaming, tabletop role-playing, like Dungeons & Dragons Live. They'll do art. They'll do music. There's just chatting on Twitch. And sometimes if you get the right people with the right audiences, that's all you need. So to get started, first, you want to understand some of the tools and the culture. So get on, sign up for Twitch. Start following some random channels on Twitch. Look into Discord. If you haven't been using Discord, it is the main chatting tool for gamers. Tiltify is a way of raising money on Twitch as well as other platforms, and then understand a little bit about broadcasting software 
like open broadcasting software. Check out some charity streams. So some ones with people I have worked with include the USO, Make-A-Wish Foundation, Children's Hospital of Orange County. They all have gaming programs. They do really good jobs with their gaming fundraising. So check theirs out and get a feel for what they're doing. And the big thing is, if you do go down this path, it can't be up down on the side of one's desk. It is an event. It needs the same discipline. It needs the same planning. It needs the same dedication that any other peer-to-peer -peer event would have. That's it. First, we're going to have David Fu, who's going to be talking about universal design in video. If you are doing video marketing at your nonprofit or you're considering it for 2023, the added benefit to, on top of just getting the word out about your programs, the added benefit is to accommodate various audience needs. Some of these needs are old needs, and some of these are newer problems to address. So there are three things to think about that video can help with. The three of them are helping get information to people on their increasingly smaller screens, video to help people with their different learning styles and different ways they take in information, and video to address the trends in how people consume media and information. Back to the first one, small screens. You might have noticed nearly everyone has a mobile device, smartphone or tablet, and increasingly more so than desktop computers. Yet everything is still made for desktop computers. So if you look at the design of phones, from design and manufacture to the way browsers work, the way media and publishers have pushed video to be as a priority, Everything is video. It's the screen size, the way anything, if you click on anything video, your phone starts, takes over and prioritizes playing a video. So one thing to think about is that if devices behave this way and people take in information this way, it's probably a good idea to show up in the way that their devices behave. Another thing is websites tend to be wordy, full of menus and hard to navigate. And when your website is offering an essential service, essential program, you want people to have an easier time navigating, easier, sorry, less steps to take, less clicking around, less navigating. So a video is a great way to deliver information with just, let's say two steps, click a video, press play. This is great for people who are on the move and people who maybe only have mobile devices at home. The second way video accommodates people is different learning styles. Some people are visual learners and some people get a lot of missing context from face communication. So. If a video features people talking, a lot of what is being communicated is done through facial expression and body language. Body language makes up the majority of communication, which is usually lost when we rely only on text. And finally, consumption trends. It's up to you and your own audience and their own ways of getting information, their own ways of getting learning about your programs and services from your website. But one example is Refugee 613 in Canada published a report about newcomer media usage trends. And there's high mobile usage among newcomers. That includes consuming entertainment, information, and learning through video, and more so than Canadian-born users. So there may be something similar in your audience to consider and video might accommodate them as well. So accommodating people with videos because of smaller screens, different learning styles, and the possibility that their, your audience is using video a lot a great way to show up for the way that they are using and getting information. And now Kevin Christopher George who's going to be talking about the HR crisis and IT systems resiliency. So it's Kevin Christopher George here of Green Merits Consulting. My tech trend for 2023 is focused on the HR crisis 
and building IT system resiliency. So my name is Kevin Christopher. I'm with Green Marriage Consulting. And Green Marriage Consulting serves as an, I, an advisor or coach to the nonprofit sector. We focus on research, selection, and contracting and data analysis of cloud-based software solutions for nonprofits and small and medium enterprises. We've helped organizations in healthcare, community services, employment services, and foreign aid and support. And then the list is growing. Where do we find ourselves currently? Just for some context, the past couple of years are presented nonprofits with a change in how things are done with remote, with the move to remote work. So we're focusing on our remote virtual workforce and the tools and solutions that are required to do work effectively. The second big one, a change in the level of need of those seeking services provided by nonprofit organizations. Going through the course of the pandemic, I think we've seen an increase in the number of requests for service and support by those that have been highly impacted by the pandemic. And then finally, a change in who does what due to a rapidly changing HR slash staffing crisis in the sector. When we take a look at some data that came out from Statistics Canada just recently, 32% of nonprofit sector employees believe retaining skilled staff will be an obstacle over the next three months, while 36% are concerned about recruiting skilled staff. So obviously there's a concern around, we've got this increasing need, we've got all these virtual tools and resources, and the concern comes around, how do we make sure that we retain our skilled staff and get new staff on board? This is going to pressing the nonprofit sector. And so where this takes us is to like, what do you do about it? And I think this is where we're going to start to see this trend come along in 2023 is that we need to start thinking about how to set up and manage our systems to handle these large staff changes that are in the sector. So first and foremost, adopting a cloud first mentality. The benefit of this approach is that you're going to reduce the need for on-site or locally managed systems and data. I still work with some organizations who have need for local mail files and local applications that are installed on their computers that require additional remote assistance, in some cases, shipping of laptops and hardwares and systems so from one place to the next. Whereas we have to start treating our computers, our laptops as a connectivity device to resources and processes and data that is stored in, a, in the cloud and has a less reliance on local applications. And second one, centralized user administration. So there's a bunch of different cloud apps containing information about your organization. Access needs to be easily and centrally managed. Think about tools like 1Password, Okta, a bunch of, a series of tools out there that can allow you to centrally manage all your different cloud applications so that it's easy to grant access as well as remove access when people come and come to and leave the organization. And then finally, create repeat, repeatable processes. Onboarding, offboarding, training, focus on how to quickly get new staff members productive. I've worked through some onboarding and offboarding processes that were really manual, really time intensive. And we have to find a way to streamline those kinds of things and make them easy using workflow and processes that are much more efficient and easily to, easy to reuse and to manage. And as I said, the trend for 2023, from the perspective of Green Merits Consulting and myself, will be on building and implementing resilient systems that can withstand rapid and increasing changes in nonprofit staff. Thanks a lot. This is Kevin from greenmerits.com. Uh, you can reach me at kgeorge at greenmerits.com. Thanks again.